Jeff. Brent. Jeff. I'm excited for this one. Jeff. I'm so excited. You for this know one. what I'm getting ready to I, say. I, I know what you're going to say. And little spoiler, but before you even get, well, you did look at your, look at your name, but, uh, you're, when we get to like the messages and the reviews and stuff, yeah, yeah. I themed these out for you. Did you? I did. I'm excited. Okay. Okay. I like it, Jeff. I'm, I, yeah, I just, I can't believe it. I, oh, so I'm watching cool. the episode, right? Like yeah, literally I'm, yeah. just, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to watch this episode and, and I'm just like, you mother <laughs> <laughs> what are you kidding me dude beat for beat on this thing the only the only thing i might have missed uh but i'm gonna i'm gonna count it the the two people that were in med lab mm -hmm. they died right i don't know i, I don't know i'm just saying that they did yeah and franklin. i got the death piece as well yeah, yeah. they probably did it's franklin yeah. taking care of them so exactly i'm just I'm going to call it. I'm, I'm saying that that's what happened. And, uh, I'm the king, baby. I'm the yeah. king. I didn't pick Buster though. Yeah. That's like, that that's like gravy on the whole thing is so good. Right. So anyway, Hey, for those of you out there going, what in the world are they talking about? <laughs> uh, we are talking about an episode of Babylon five season three, episode six, I believe. Yeah. It's the title of this video. If you're watching it, like literally just look down there. It's the title. You literally would know what this is. Yeah, that's right. Dust to dust. Yeah. We were watching the episode dust to dust, or we have watched it. Jeff and I have watched it for the very first time. We are about to report, report. We're, we're going to report. Reporting. Yeah. It's a new thing. We're going to report our cod past. <laughs> I can't it talk gets better. It. it gets better. <laughs> we're going to record our podcast. Uh, on this episode and what you guys are out there watching is the behind the scenes this is how we do it this is how uh this is how the mint julep is mixed Ooh, look at just you just had the kentucky derby a couple weeks ago there yeah. jeff uh let's see here this is how the ugly lady's hat gets made this is how the horse gets shooed or shod depending on where you come from how the divot gets what's that they do i don't know Sorry. filled yeah, I watched one movie about the Kentucky Derby a long time ago. <laughs> it's what I got. <laughs> For those of you who don't know that Brent is originally from Kentucky, it is it is my home. Yeah, and you were in that movie also, by the way. Sea Biscuit. I sea was. Biscuit, I yeah. There's a, there's a shot where the camera is panning across, and I'm in the infield. I'm wearing a brown jacket with a hat, and you can see me running just this big old blob, just sort of waddling as he goes. That's that that was me. Yep, absolutely. You, um, you you are one hundred percent of my Kentucky Derby experience. So. <laughs> <laughs> Between this conversation here and that go. movie, you're it. There you go. There you go. Actually, the the racetrack that they filmed that that movie in is called Keeneland, which is in my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky, about an hour down the road from Churchill Downs, where they have the Derby. Uh, I prefer Keeneland over Churchill Downs, to be honest oh. with you. Um, but it was it was neat. It, it's neat to be at the movie Sea Biscuit. If you guys have ever seen Sea Biscuit, Toby McGuire's in it. Um, uh, it really was a good movie. Yeah. Um, I, I say that as if like I had anything right. really to do. With it. Like, no, they put out an open casting call that nobody got paid for. That's like, hey, come fill up the stands. That's all it was. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but it was it was neat because like I know Keeneland really well. Um, and it was neat how they they shot different racetracks all within this one racetrack, and they just did different portions. Okay. And different element. Hey, I know where that is. That's not in New York. That's still here in Keeneland. And oh, I know where that shot is. That's you know. Anyway, people aren't here to hear about Sea Biscuit or racehorsing or maybe maybe they are. Like we, they just didn't know it. They're just like, wow, I'm really into this. All of a sudden, I had no right. idea. Right. So no, we are here to talk about uh, dust to dust, Jeff. That is what we're here. If you guys are here, please like, subscribe, do all that. You guys are a freaking amazing. Um, uh, please join us, join this community. So much fun stuff happening. Jeff, let's do an episode. Let's do it. First time. You're new here, or Someday, somewhere, I'll make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5, for the first time, not 
a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen. And I, despite what some of you out there are thinking right now, am also watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. I promise you I've never seen anything beyond this episode before. This is it. And I didn't see this week's episode before I did last week's episode. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters watching Babylon 5 for the very first time. And in this show, the shtick, the twist of this show is that we are comparing Babylon 5 to Star Trek. Absolutely not. That is not yeah, what we're doing. That is today. not what we do. No. But what we are doing is we are taking that over analytical lens where we look for morals, messages, and meanings in a sci-fi show. And we're applying it right here to Babylon 5. And we're also just trying to see how much we liked this show. Like Brent said, this is not a... And like Brent said, this is not a podcast about Star Trek. We are not comparing Babylon 5 to Star Trek, but we both do have Star Trek podcasts and we've watched a whole lot of it before. So those Star Trek references are sure to make their way in. But to help us with that, we've decided that we will have a rule of three Trek references each per episode. And that's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> hey, Brent. Hey, Jeff. We got an email at Ooh. Babylon5first at gmail.com. It's the number okay. five of the word first at gmail.com. This is from Andrew, and Andrew sent us a note about life lessons from Babylon 5. All right. Choice and responsibility. Our choices matter, and they shape and impact not only our own lives, but those around us. It's important to not only recognize this, but to take responsibility for those choices, good or bad, and whether the consequences are intended or not. Always stand up for what you believe in, no matter the cost, and no matter if you stand alone. Appreciate the moments because they're all that we have. You're alive now, today, and that may not be true tomorrow. So appreciate what you have and do the best with the time that you've ha that you've got. That's Babylon okay. 5 accord that's the life lessons of Babylon 5 according to Andrew. Oh. Okay. I was like I mean, it all sounds good, but what does this have to do with us and what we're doing here? Okay. Nothing with us. Everything with, to do with Babylon 5. Okay, cool, Andrew. Uh, yeah. I mean, thanks for doing our podcast for us. So I went ahead and themed these next couple that I'm going to, I got two more on here. I, I themed up a little bit based on, we'll just say you. Over on our Discord. Just say you, me? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Over on our Discord, which you can get access to through our Patreon, patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first, the number five, the word first, uh, the, that's linked down in the notes as well. But we've been talking, ironically, about Brent's hit streak and Jeff's misses on the predictions. And Framed Narat said, hey, Brent, don't worry about it. Jeff's a P negative four. I don't think you're going to need anything, including Mary had a little lamb to block him from getting any guesses, right? <laughs> oh, that's Nia, right? Yeah, that's Nia. Totally. Nia's awesome, man. That's cool. <laughs> that was good. And then over on YouTube, uh -huh. Sir, Sir Nukalot had a good one. Pretty on point. I, I'm just going to put it. It's so perfect because a couple of us are thinking this says, ha, 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 sometimes I swear Brent is psychic and has probably read the script. <laughs> <laughs> I've just watched a lot of sci-fi. I, it, I mean, it, like, there are some things that you're just like, this has to be the next line. And in good writing... That is the next line because you set me up to be there. You need to deliver. There is such a thing as subverting expectations, 
but generally you want it to pay off. There was one line uh, specifically. Oh, you know what it was in this episode, Jeff? Uh, people can see it if they go back and watch my uh, my reaction video to this episode. But uh, it, it's when Bester first comes on the station. He's looking at Sheridan. And Sheridan's like, what, well, do you want me to give it to you straight? And Bester's all like, yeah, straight up. Yeah. And, Be- and, and Sheridan just walks up and just looks at him. And I said while Sheridan was in process of walking up, well, I don't like you. Like I, I just I just said that. And then and then Bruce Boxleitner opens his mouth and goes, I don't like you. I was like, Yeah, like, I got this. I just it happens, man. It happens. Just living my life three seconds ahead of everything that's happening. Listen, listen. you know what though? I, for for all of it, my wife is like 50 times better than this than I am. Really? Yeah, and like we'll watch those those like who done it shows. Uh, we we like uh, we usually do the comedy ones, so we'll do like Psych or Monk or you know those 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 kinds of episodes. And usually within like the first ten minutes, she's like, "Oh yeah, it's that person right there." And I'm like, "How did you know that? They haven't even given you enough information yet. How did you know that? It wasn't even a part of it." Well, Jeff. As fun as that is. It is fun. As fun as that is. I bet you don't know where I'm going with with this next. I think I do. I I got this one. Oh yeah. Make a prediction. Go ahead. This Negative is us. Rating. This is us on our predictions. Predicting our predictions that well, that you were pretty darn right on. Yeah. So yeah. with our rule of three, we play a game at the end of the show where we try to guess what next week's episode is gonna be based on title alone. Never having seen a thumbnail, uh, or at least paying attention to it. Never reading a description. Not that those ever really matter, especially when you're looking at this on like Netflix. Or, and this isn't on Netflix, but you know what I mean. That little blurb. They those are almost never right. We've never read any of that stuff. We have no idea what's happening. It's just the title of the episode. We make a guess, and you guys all laugh at us because we're very wrong last week, Jeff. I made a commitment to the folks out there. You did. Yes, you did. <laughs> I told them, I, I said, it has been way too long since I've gotten right on one of these predictions. I guarantee to win this week. Now, I'll get to mine in just a moment, but Jeff, do you remember what you said last week this episode was going to be about? The runner-up behind by 64 and a half miles. Jeff, what did you <laughs> guess this one was going to be? <laughs> I totally thought that we were going to this is going to be the ashes to ashes, dust to dust kind of a, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. And we would get a look back at Ivanova's childhood, maybe explore some of her dad's, uh, the, the, the death, his death and how that impacted her, but really focusing on what it was like growing up as a latent telepath. And I mean, Hey, they said the words latent telepath in this one that so, was a piece of this whole episode it really yeah was. like so i mean the, i got some of the words right so hey brent why don't you tell us what you guessed yeah, you also got words like uh and the the and they used the a couple you times. got is a few times what ivanova is? was in the episode yes she was. I mentioned her so yes yeah. she was yes so here's what i said i i pieced it together real fast dust is the drug that we've heard about so often here on Babylon five. So often, so often. I mean, it was in the first episode and we've, they, they do mention it time and time, you know, they've mentioned it enough that it sticks in my brain. Somebody out there is making a comment right now. They've actually only said it three times throughout the course of the series so far. And here are the timestamps of the episodes. That exactly. Are, Somebody's we got doing you. that right now. We got and Hey, you out there doing it. You're awesome. You go. That's do you, that's, that's the kind of, that's the level of commitment and nerddom that I need from the community out here, Jeff. It really is. Uh, cause I could probably do that with a few Star Trek episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, but anyway, I said that this episode was going to be about dust. I said it was going to be moving through the station. And they've got to figure it out and it's killing people as it's going through the station and they're going to have to do it. I might have gotten all of that right. Yeah, hundred percent of that. Yes, and I know some people are like, "Well, nobody died." I'm, look, those two people on gurneys, they were on gurneys. We're just going to go ahead and say that they died. And yeah, I, I will say it probably wasn't dust that killed them. It was Franklin and his irresponsibility. <laughs> but I mean, the dust is what brought them into med labs. So. Was that before or after Franklin tried to kiss them? 
<laughs> with his extra cot that he has that in no one else movie. gets. Yeah. <laughs> we could go on. We're not going to, but we could. Hey, let, there are a couple pieces to this episode, though, Brent, that I, I take some solace in that you missed. So to remind oh, yeah. everybody mm. what this episode was about, including those pieces that you didn't quite get, why don't you take us through Dust to Dust? Well, hey, remember last week when Chicky came in and set up a whole bunch of new rules trying to control people's thoughts and opinions? Well, it looks like some a-hole security guards are taking it upon themselves to enforce those rules, even though Chicky ain't here no more. Well, this doesn't sit too well with Sheridan, who says that the Ministry of Peace isn't here, and this is Babylon 5. So if this happens again, there will be consequences meanwhile down below a bunch of people who are clearly tripping on something hardcore are going haywire ripping pipes and conduits off the wall screaming into the void make it stop none of whom by the way were dwight schultz i know because i checked it seems these people are wait for it on dust this is the drug that we've heard about from time to time ever since the gathering. Only this time we get a little bit more information on what it does. It seems that this drug can give the taker a highly advanced, if not temporary, telepathic ability. And it can even enhance the latent telepathic abilities that are found inside of non-telepaths, which is totally awesome. Telepaths, you say? Well, that just means that this would be a great time for our dear old friend Bester to show up. And guess what? He's right outside waiting to dock. Everyone's a bit nervous about having him on board the station as he likes to scan people without their permission, which is kind of against the side core rules. But Delenn has an idea that just might work. But Ivanova would rather just blast him out of the sky or space. Sheridan stops her by saying, fight them without becoming them anyway delenn's cool idea is simply this get a bunch of mimbari telepaths who just happen to be on the station for some unknown reason or maybe they're actually the mimbari that are located on the white star i'm not really sure but collectively they can actually stop bester from scanning people that is unless bester is willing to take this new drug which is going to suppress his own telepathic abilities, which he does. And honestly, I'm not really sure that it works. Jeff and I will talk about that a little bit later, but Hey, let's just suppose that it does. And with that Garibaldi and Bester go all good cop, bad cop, trying to find out who's moving the dust through the station. And you're never going to believe who it was. Lindstrom. Who's that? Well, that's just some guy we've just met, but he has been hired by Jakar, of all people, to bring dust into the station, smuggle it in, because Jakar believes that he can use this as a weapon against the Centauri. We're not really told exactly what Jakar plans to do with it, and honestly, I'm not really sure what it was and if it would have worked anyway, but as Lindstrom explains to Jakar exactly how this drug works, Jakar tells us that while there are no more Narn telepaths today, there did in fact used to be some way back in the day. They were just exterminated. So Jakar gives the drug a go, and it turns Jakar into an all-out raving lunatic monster, ripping up and destroying everything in his path. And that's the point when he decides to go get Londo and go get him he does. Jakar rips Londo a new hole, like a lot of new holes. And then in an almost improbable way, initiates a mind meld. <laughs> Jakar is walking around inside Londo's head. He's seeing the embarrassing moment that Londo gets promoted to being the ambassador of Babylon 5. He also gets flashes of basically everything we've seen from Londo in the first two seasons, including 
his collusion with Morden and the shadows. Chikar freaks out over this whole thing because now he knows that it's Londo's fault. Londo has been at the center of this whole thing. And just about the time Jakar tries to kill Londo, he is stopped in his vision by his dying father strung up in a tree. His father tells him that he has to put aside the endless cycle of hatred and try to build a better future. And then, at least according to what the subtitles on the episode told me, his father turns into Jaquan and you were there and you were there and you were there and you were there. And Jaquan begins to tell him and convince Jakar that he has to do the right thing because otherwise, if he doesn't do the right thing, it's going to lead to the destruction of all Narn of the entire race. And he says, yes, it's true. Some are going to have to be sacrificed in order to save everyone else. And then suddenly Jakar slash or, or Jaquan slash Jakar's daddy turns into Jalan, which is the Narn version of Kosh, who just goes flying away. When Jakar wakes up stone sober, having just met his God face to face. Jakar accepts full responsibility for his actions and the ombuds, ombudsman woman person throws the book at Jakar for his utter destructive assault on Londo by sentencing him to 60 days in the brig. Jakar seems like he's a new man though. And as this episode ends, we see Bester leaving the station, talking to another psychop lamenting that the dust which the core created to make new telepaths hasn't really ever worked but at least it's back among the humans where it belongs the end jeff what did you think of this episode of babylon 5 i love bester episodes like he even made mind war almost watchable Right. Like he's right. just so good. Right. I'm going to tell you though, here's my hot take. Bester was right. He was justified and he was actively bullied by the crew of Babylon five in this episode. I think that the crew were the villains in, uh, in this one. Uh, okay. <laughs> Explain yourself. Well, I mean, we can talk about it when we start diving in, but I mean, right. dude didn't even walk in the door yet. And they're, they're talking about killing him. Like they're in a war council being like, you know, I think our only real option here is to kill him. And he's just here to do the same thing he did last time he was here. I think the last time we saw him was the, uh, uh, race Isn't through the underground railroad. Yeah. Episode? Race through dark places thing is the underground yeah. railroad and Hey, underground railroad fine you know was helping unregistered telepaths also highly illegal he was just there doing his job it's what he's doing here also they took a lot of their fears a lot of their assumptions with honestly very little evidence and dumped it right on top of him and treated him that way i think they were horrible to him but you know who else was horrible in this one in such an awesome way? And that's Jakar. Bester. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Bester was also terrible. That's right. the thing. We see parts of Bester, you know, talking like we saw him in the race through dark places where he, you know, pulled the extracted the thing out of dude's mind and just didn't even yeah. care that he died. Yeah. Nobody, nobody on the, on the station saw that his right. little back and forth with the psychop here. Nobody saw that. They don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. ugh, I, Whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to stand up for Bester through this one. That's my position. But Jakar, man, dude, he hit rock stinking bottom in this yeah. episode doing drugs, beating Londo within an inch of his life. I mean, even at the end, Franklin's like, I don't know if he's going to make it. Like, I don't know if yeah. he's going to do okay. Yeah. And I think that's, and I, I loved, I loved that he's there. And I love, uh, the, just, we'll, just the, God, the, the, the games that, that Kosh is playing at this point, he's just moving all this stuff. I really, I really dug this episode. Like Jakar went last week. I think we were talking about, he should be the next guy on the war council. Yeah. He, he's gone from that to hundred percent. Just he's the wild card mm. now. Like who knows? 
Who I knows what religious I, fervor he's going to come up with? Yeah, now. I don't think so. I, I think his whole experience with Jaquan or whatever it was, Jalon, at the end of this episode is uh, he he's going to, I think Jakar is going to become the catalyst for Londo Malari's redemption. Yeah. And I say that saying that Londo Malari is irredeemable. Okay. And this episode proved it yet again. A big time. Uh, but it, like that whole scene with the Drazi, like Londo is disgusting. He is a piece of trash. Well, he even, he even like was big timing and, and insulting Veer in the work that Veer yeah. was doing. I mean, he was just, yeah. he was just, except for the very, very end, you know, we can, we can talk through that a little bit, but everything up until the very, very end, he was just a piece of absolute Centauri garbage. Just yep horrible absolutely horrible what did what were your first first reactions to this one yeah so um i liked this episode like not just because i was completely right but i really really enjoyed this episode um The, the biggest surprise of this episode to me, though, was Jakar. Big time. The, the yeah. fact that Jakar thought to bring drugs into the station and he was going to somehow weaponize that. Who thinks that? I'm going to use this as a, as a weapon of war. Now, if, if you're trying to subvert a government long term, if you're trying to bring down a people long term, I could kind of see how this works. You know, you've got years and years and years to wait. You're fine. You're going to play the long game. Fine. Jakar is in the middle of a war for the very existence of his people. Mm -hmm. The longer he waits, the more his people suffer and the more his people die. He does not have time to go through this process. So I'm not entirely like, I don't know if maybe he was trying to like, uh, send it out there and let the, let the Centauri destroy themselves. Like get them all hopped up on dust and have them all destroying themselves. I, I don't know what he was trying to do. Um, but the revelation that, and I don't know that we've ever heard this before, Jeff, so correct me if I'm wrong. The revelation that Narn used to be telepaths. Because we saw, I mean, I think this was a, a gathering episode or maybe it was the next episode after that. Jakar is trying to mate. He's trying to bring telepaths into his community, into his people. And turns out they used to be there. And Narns carry a latent telepathic gene. Yeah, that was huge. We hadn't heard that because you're right. There was the gathering and then there was the episode with uh, the, the human telepath that Talia and Ivanova were fighting over who ended up going to Minbar. Where again, oh, like yeah, that was yeah. the deal with Natoth set up was that like, you can come, we're going to, you know, we, we can breed you, we can do all these things. So they're trying yeah. to rebuild it. But the fact that they used to be telepaths, that was news completely. Yeah. And I, and I thought too, cause they said it a number of times, this drug works by activating the latent telepath gene mm -hmm. in people, which I got two takeaways there. One was the Narn have an active telepath gene still or latent or whatever, cause it worked for, for Jakar. Jakar, yeah. But all humans have one because it seems to work. Like you don't hear about them doing the dust and it not working. So yeah, it goes back to my theory and, on. Well, the I'm sorry. Can I, oh. can I jump in on that? Yeah. Though? Because what it makes me have to wonder is how is it different than what Ivanova is? Because Ivanova has called herself a latent telepath, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where she clearly has telepathic ability. They're just really, really weak. You know, uh, but she clearly has it. There's something different about her. I.e., was it last week that we saw where she plugged into the machine? I think and so. And yeah. was like, hey, what's going on with you? Because most humans shouldn't be able to do that. Well, duh. She's got the whole latent telepath. Like, that's different than having the latent telepath gene. I think about it like, and I, I'm, I'm going to show my ignorance here, but like, we'll say yeah. blue eyes, right? Like. A lot of people have a latent blue eye gene, but I don't have blue eyes. 
you know, so a lot of people have the latent telepath gene, but she is a latent telepath. Like she has some yeah. abilities. Most humans probably just don't have any ability. They just have the gene mm -hmm. in there. And that's probably showing my ignorance of the word latent more than anything. But it is wild. And I think you, you ask a great question. What was the plan? Right? Was he going to load up a bunch of Centauri with it and have them go and like get into the Centauri or a bunch of Narns with it and have them go and get into Centauri's heads? Or was yeah. he going to poison the water supply on Centauri Prime? Or someone's I, poison the water hole, right? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it, it's a it's a messed up. That is a villain, hardcore guerrilla warfare kind of idea. But I don't know how it's supposed to work. I don't either. I. I have no idea. I, I think honestly, given everything that's going on, that's probably supposed to be the least of our concerns as the viewer right now. Right. Um, because dust is back. It's moving through the station. Jakar has done this. And, uh, but I mean, okay. Is it just me or did Bester really not serve any purpose in this episode, except for the final line where he was like, Hey, you know, we created this. And it didn't work to bring out any new telepaths. So let's walk away. At least we have it back. Like that was the old, like to give us that particular revelation. Bester didn't serve any real purpose in the rest of this episode, other than just being awesome outside. Yeah. Outside of that piece at the very end, they could have gotten a, a, a stellar calm right from earth force saying, Hey, we got a lead. There's a bunch of dust moving through the station. Here's what we know. They could yeah. have done that, and we would have had the exact same yeah. episode. I mean, Garibaldi could have gone and interrogated that guy without Bester sitting right there, and it had been literally the same conversation. Mm -hmm. The only difference right? is we got to hold up a huge mirror to Garibaldi and how he behaves in every interrogation. Oh, but Garibaldi had to call Bester out on doing that exact same thing. Right, right. Um, so not really a best like bester was in it but this wasn't a bester episode though it wasn't but it, it was a For bester that. episode and that it added a lot to like he definitely they took advantage of it being bester in the episode you know what sure. i mean like mm -hmm. bester's here we're gonna use I, the way i see it is it's it was about building on his character the because mm -hmm. we talked about in the last episode he was on the reason bester works as a villain is mm -hmm. because we believe that he believes He's doing the right thing and he's got points that we can connect with him on. So, you know, I mean, speaking of that, when he's giving his little speech in this episode about, um, oh, what was he saying? He, he was talking about, uh, uh, he's here to look out for people and for humanity and yeah. he's, he's really working on the side of earth and like, I'm sitting there going, either Walter Koenig is a much better actor than I ever gave him credit for, or I'm actually believing that Bester really might have the best intentions here, even though a lot of his methods are bad. He really may have some of the best intentions when it comes to uh, earth and, and people and humanity. And then we got the final sentence where he's like, yeah, we created all this trying to make little telepaths and none of that work. So huh, whatever. Back to the At least we're going to screw them up some more anyway. Yeah, somehow. Like, well, but you're you, right. You, when they were like, doing that, it was. It was yeah. literally that because it was, it was not only that he thinks he's standing up for humanity, but he's like, there are so many things going on you don't even know about because we stopped them. Like, we're yeah. there. We're stopping them. But it is, it's kind of funny you mentioned his acting because I watched this one with my wife, which is not a thing I, I normally do. Right. And at first she was like, Hey, is that, you know, is that, is that check off? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But he actually gets to do stuff in, right. in this series. He gets to do things. And she's like, well, it looks like they told him to forget everything he ever learned in acting school and just be as wooden as possible. And it was, it was in the scene, I'll, 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 in the team, in the scene where he says, oh yeah, that's what and we learned in her dissect. Oh, never mind. That, yeah. Which by the way, we will not be they seeing evil Talia. They dissected Talia? Dissected. Are you kidding me? Totally biology 101 Talia Winters. Which honestly now that okay, which is another thing where Psychor is evil. Like we're I'm not disputing yeah. that Psychor is is the is evil and horrible in this, but the way we were we kind of take things is oh they, they got these latent uh personalities and people waiting to take over. They're making dust, trying to do stuff, they're breeding people together. 
Bester was literally, I believe, truly shocked at what happened to Talia. I think Psychor as a whole was surprised, and that's why they dissected her, debriefed and dissected her. Was what the heck happened here? How did we do this? I don't think Psychor is as... Some people in Psychor, I'll say that. Some people in Psychor are not nearly... And we know that with Harem and Gray, Ray ba way back, Jeffrey Combs. Right. You know, and I think there's some stuff with, with Bester as well, where it's just they're not nearly as evil as, as we often think them to be. Jeff, they dissected Dahlia. Well, yeah, because they were curious. I mean, that I didn't say they were good. I mean, like, no, I look, I don't, I don't know what happened with Dahlia. I don't know. I don't know what uh, Andrea Thompson, seriously, that was her act, the actress's name. I don't know what she did to piss people off. I know. Her and Jerry O'Doyle divorced at some point, I think, during the run of the show. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it. I don't know if she slept with the wrong person. I don't know what she did. But she, you know, like like Michael O'Hare gets, is that his name? Michael O'Hare, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, it, he goes out for, for uh, understandable but not the best reasons, but they left a window open for him to return. The, the the who was the doctor from the gathering we liked a lot uh benjamin kyle that guy there's a they've mentioned him at least once and there's still a window that he could be out there lita alexander returned she's, yeah like, she's back they they left these doors open people we've heard about the trap door that the jms had for all of his characters he trap doored her and then slammed the door shut yeah and said you're done on this show yeah, that's hardcore, oh. hardcore. And I'm so sad because that means we're not going to see evil Talia again. I know. Like, I know. Selfishly, oh it's a loss. I mean, it's a huge right. loss, but, but, but I think it, as much as, as I'm saying, Psychor is not as evil as we make him out to be. They have zero regard for life, for human life whatsoever. And this, I mean, wow. What, what, yeah. what better? Hey, we're curious about this. Let's die. Let's cut you open as a human being that we've already yeah. basically killed. And then, and then cut you open on yeah, top of that, it. Th that actually begs a really good question that has not much really to do with this episode, but it, it's worth talking. If Psychor doesn't care about life, and they clearly have shown that they don't, they have they have no regard for the sovereignty of, of a person, right? They will breed them. They will force them into marriages. They will force them to join the group or be drugged or die. They will hunt people down. They will, they will implant personalities into their head to use them as, as whatever. Uh, they're working with the shadows we now know, right? Yep. Um, they eliminated uh, the, the president to put in their own guy. They're doing whatever they got going on with Mars. Psychor is bad news. They don't care about people. So what do they care about? What, like, what is Psychor? So what are they, they obviously, if they, if they don't care about people, that also means they don't really care about earth. They're not doing this to be propping up earth. Otherwise they would care about people. What is it that Psychor really cares about? I think they care about earth and I think they care about people. They care about the best people and everything else is chaff and dead weight and needs to be purged. It's, it's a master race kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And in their mind, you know, master race to them are telepaths and not just all tell. I mean, clearly look how they treat most of the people who are telepaths It is a mm -hmm. very upper crust sort of a thing. And so I think, I think it's what they would consider true humanity to be. Um, maybe, maybe. Maybe I hope we'll find out over the course of the show. I really, it's a good point. It's like, we're here. What, what did he, I, he has said? Um, oh, I found it cause I took the note and I found it here. Bester sees himself and Psychor as all that stand between humanity and the abyss. Does he really though? Or was this just the line he was feeding, feeding them? Because like, like I said, I almost believed that Bester was really here until we got to that final scene and we saw that line of them walking away. And that, for me, anyway, completely erased everything. All the good stuff. What well, I think, I think it all depends on how you define the abyss, right? Because the abyss, I think, I would define it as being humans and other races that aren't up to their standards.
you're no good. You're not worth anything. You know, you're, you're a waste of air in our resources. Mm-hmm. So I'll use you as long as you're useful and then you're gone. Just completely disposable. So that, that, that master, that the 1%, you know, as it were, or the great Brazilian uh, sci-fi show 3% I'm the 3% that mm-hmm. gets to exist. That's what they're after. They're after that little tiny slice of humanity. I think. All right. Well, um, Hey, real quick question about Bester. How did he know that that drug was going to take three hours to work? It's a, it's, it's a psychor drug. Well, but he said that they were, they, they had Franklin said they modified it. Oh yeah. It's good. Do point. something for him. How did Bester know it was going to take three hours? I'm just saying. And then when you take that and you put that into the, the conversation that they had where they were interrogating the one dude, and, uh, you know, and I'm like, Bester just read that dude's mind. This medicine's not working on Bester. I like, wanted, despite what they have you to believe, I don't know that that medicine really worked on Bester. I really I don't. wanted to think that, especially in that scene, I wanted to think it, but he was right. Like, and he, 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 he knew, knows he's got a card to play. He's got that badge. He's got that uniform. All, and, and dude even said, sure. stay out of my mind. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, strike that from the record, Mr. Garibaldi. He's right. He does. He does have rights. You're right. It's. But so I think it was a little, I, I saw that scene less as saying the drug didn't work and more as just like him holding that mirror up to Garibaldi and being like, you abuse your power just like I'm abusing my power. Cause I, I took it the other direction. It's going to take three hours. Cool. I'll come down in four. I'll even build in a buffer. I am so, I am so willing to do whatever it takes because you've made up this huge straw man that I, you know, that I am mm-hmm. whatever. Cool. Give me your drugs. I'll give you extra time. Call me a pinata. Cool. I'll roll with it. Whatever. Doesn't Call matter. Pinata, he says. <laughs> that was great. I loved that. <laughs> well, you think I'm full of candy and toys and children love me. That's great. <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh, so the, the Mimbari, uh, that whole situation. I, okay. Do we just need to fill in time in this episode? Like, I, like I'm, I'm struggling with what this was really all about. The telepaths. Like, are, are we, yeah. The, the whole thing with Sheridan and Bester and the telepaths shutting them down and, oh, here's this drug. And like, it just felt like maybe we were filling in time by the end of the episode. Almost to be honest, but I, I still think like, I don't know if this was intentional and I I'm probably reading too much into it, but it was literally hi, Bester. We don't know you. We don't trust you and we don't like you. And I, I respect that both Sheridan and Ivanova just said as much to his face, right? Mm -hmm. That's cool. At least you're being honest with him, but, but they're like, Hey, we're either going to have these Minbari hanging out with us so they can block you, or you're going to take this drug. So your abilities don't work one or the Mm -hmm. other. Here you go. And I think the point was him. I, I think what it did is it showed that his intent truly was to protect earth's interests. I don't want Minbari around hearing this stuff. So if Mm -hmm. that means you got to give me a drug and suppress my talent, fine. I'm happy to do that because I'm all that stands between you and the abyss. Because I mean, when you think about when they talked about it in the war council, it's so I, I, what we know, I, what I said earlier, what we know about Bester and what the crew of Babylon five know about Bester are very different things, mm-hmm. but knowing what we know of what the crew knows of Bester, their behavior in everything they did and said, basically held up a huge spotlight and said, Hey, Bester, psycho or psychop guy, we have stuff we are actively trying to hide from you. And we're going to go to extreme measures to make sure that we can keep hiding it from you. Um, and now, you know, that we're hiding things from you. So Mm. please don't come back and try and surprise us in some way and try and scan us or try and learn something, please. Like the whole thing just felt pretty Bush league, to be honest to me. It felt like they were, I mean, like I said earlier, he hadn't even gotten on the station and they are threatening to kill him. Ivanova ordered the station to fire on him. And I get, she has a different set of circumstances. She's got a different yeah. relationship with Psychor. I get that. But for everybody else, like 
that just seemed it, it seemed extreme and i and i feel like i feel like they're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where someone well, is going to show up and they're going to totally they, expose them but the thing is they really did have something that they couldn't let oh totally Bester know about they couldn't yeah. let him know about this what are they calling it the 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 conference of light or whatever it, yeah you know, something conspiracy of light or whatever they're calling themselves um that they they literally can't let him find out about that like to me you know what the easiest answer to the whole deal is don't be on the station when he gets there exactly exactly or hey zach <laughs> I got one for you. I, yeah. I need you to go work with Bester on this. Yeah, you guys go find this out. Give him whatever he needs, and we're going to be gone. We're going to be away at a conference. Something, yeah. There's always yeah. a conference going Oop. on. Okay, so Sheridan, Ivanova, Garibaldi, all gone. Who's in charge of the station? You know, in the season one, they talked about that. There has to be a command-level person. There has to be a command-level person. I don't know if there's any other command-level people. That's a very few command level people for a base like that. Uh huh. You know, like anyway. Oh, there's dude. Um. Dude. Oh my gosh. What's he's he's in the command and control place. He's a lieutenant. Somebody. He's the one who um when Ivanova when they were doing the SAT prep for the alien probe, and uh -huh. Sheridan said something, and Ivanova's like, "Did you hear that? Did you hear that?" He's like, no, ma'am, I didn't hear that. Yeah, you didn't hear that. Like, he's got some back and forth. He's Lieutenant somebody, I think. I forget okay. his name. I bet he'd be in charge. Okay, fair enough. He gets so lines. Yeah, he gets lines. Yeah. He has a rank. So that's, yeah. Okay. Put him in he's, charge. Right. He's probably got a name in the script somewhere, right? Yeah, put him there yeah. and have Zach in charge of security. They're good. There you Problem go. solved. See, that's, I mean, you've got to have that piece. I mean, it could, it could be like in Discovery where everybody's a Lieutenant Commander now. Or higher. Well, yeah, everybody's so. a commander. Why not? And heck, you can't even see our ranks on here anymore. We don't, doesn't, you can't even. Anyway, anyway. Okay. Um, do, do you want to touch on the beginning piece of the episode real quick? Yeah. It, that it, was, was, it was a carryover from last week a bit. I think it was an important one too, right? Cause yeah. that was. Uh, shopkeeper was putting up little placards saying, you know, get the assassin out of office and anti Clark thing. And the security guard was basically harassing him, telling him it was against the rules to take down, called yeah. down and brought Sheridan, brought the commander of the station in on the conversation. And the commander was like, um, how about new? He said something like, uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Cause the, the security guy was, I mean, Hey, I'm just following orders. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Because he just wanted to stop to it. I, you can't help but think, though, we talked last week how I'm pretty sure that whole that whole Clark investigation thing is not going to turn out the way the Council of Light is hoping it will turn out. So is, right. is Sheridan allowing that, what they'll end up calling propaganda on the station, that, that's going to be yet another thing that they're going to use to try and drive that will ultimately drive him and the crew away from earth force. His seditious acts, his seditious station, acts, right. station captain. Right. But speaking of seditious acts who that aren't seditious yes. at all, that was a really terrible segue, but we got Veer. Veer came back. Veer is back. Love it. And he Love came it. back. I was so and glad to see him. Speaking of you nailing things, he came back in almost the exact way you said you hoped he would. And that's like dressed like a Minbari, totally, totally buying Dude, into their way of life. I want a Minbari robe of welcoming. That looks so cozy. Like that, that would be, that would be something that Brent would go to a con and be like, yo, you got my size? Cause I'm buying this thing. Yep. Let's make right. this thing happen. Yeah. Like Etsy hit me up. Let me give you the dimensions I need it made in. Come on, let's go. But he's loving it. He's loving yeah. it on Minbar, and he's yeah. killing it. It sounds like it's yeah, he's doing a doing great job. Veer's doing his uh, doing his thing, man. When Veer says to Delenn and, and Lanier at the end, he's like, "Hey, listen, I just want to take a moment and say thanks for everything you're doing to help me out because this is really cool. I'm really enjoying this. This is great." And and you know, honestly, the I, I made a note for this. The hope that Veer holds out in his heart for Londo is so refreshing and it's so endearing. I think it's so misplaced. Like Londo does not deserve Veer. 
I'm not sorry, Veer does not deserve Londo. Whatever it is. Um, that probably actually works both ways. It does work. <laughs> right? both. Um, yeah. Uh, but it just, and, and I, you know, and I, I, I mean, Jeff, this, this is their next t-shirt. In a world full of Londos, be a Veer. Be a Veer. Be a yes. Veer. Be a Veer, be a Lanier. Don't be a Natoth. <laughs> Don't be a Natoth. That's so true. I'm going to capture that right now. <laughs> YouTube we, watching this happen. We actually have a list of t-shirt ideas that Jeff and I have started keeping track of. All right. But Veer was great. Londo sucked, though. I, I know. I think we referenced this a minute ago. Londo just sucked. I totally. Totally. Oh, gosh. It started in that... Um, that peace negotiation between the the Drazi and him yeah. and just the just the the pettiness right what yeah. was it he hey, wanted we need seven? a buffer zone and we need seven of your calling plans well you said you only needed two well you know we've had to go in and spend a bunch of money to secure the area meaning to take your zones now we got to take more of your zone because you made us take your zone like wait what yeah last yeah. week when when uh chicky is that her name when chicky was like yeah. yeah they're not warmongers because we don't sign treaties with warmongers yeah this this miss musante is what warmongering looks like right like textbook textbook thing here and then right. he even veer veer hands his report on minbar to londo and asks for him to look over it which is a great thing you got a mentor you got to say hey i'm doing this thing will you look it over check it out and he's just like yeah you can't say this Oh my God! I haven't seen political naivete and like like the, just tearing Veer apart. He said, "He said, yeah, since Emperor so and so did this, and we said that he needed to be sterilized. Yeah, and then we realized who he was married to, and we didn't realize it didn't matter. So it was like, wow, that's but like something else. That was just it was just mean. It was just mean right. of him. And like you right. said, that hope that he holds out, Veer holds out for him. He even said, like to to Lanier and Delenny says, you know, God, we just gotta get we gotta get Londo to Minbar, you know, just the the peace there and everything. It's it, it'd be such a great thing. And Lanier had this great line where he said that a a the darkness in the heart cannot be cured by moving the body. Right. That, that was so deep. That was just such great insight. And it also, I think, is Lanier, who has a bond with Londo as well. Basically, uh -huh. Lanier's saying, Yeah, that, that dude's toast. <laughs> like, right. don't bring him to my planet. So I think all I really have left is Jakar's trip. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you, you remember how Ivanova wanted to uh, take out Bester? Yes. And then she's like, can we wound him <laughs> just a little? I wanted to do that with Londo. And I'll, I'll be real on a spoiler alert. When Jakar went after Londo, I didn't feel the least bit bad for Londo. When Londo's sitting there like flopping around like a guppy on the shore, I was like, dude, you deserve every single ounce of that. You know what's bad? Even worse than that. Like now, that? now that we're doing our true confessions here, yeah. when when he w busts in and he's holding Veer up, you know, Darth Vader style in A New Hope, just uh -huh. and they, I was like, wow, that sure sucks for Veer. I'm okay with him taking that hit, knowing what's about to come for Londo. Mm. Like I'm not happy Veer was hurt. That's horrible, and it's a, the heartbreaking part of this. But right. that level, like him being okay, makes that level of collateral damage. Like, okay, it's okay. Londo needed to have his butt handed to him, and he needed it. And I love too how Jakar just staring at him face to face after he beat him up. He's just laying there staring him down, mm -hmm. waiting to get into his mind. Like Londo oh needed my. that. Well, let's talk about that. So Jakar is going off the rails. He try. By the way. Before he does anything, he tries it himself. I actually respect Jakar for that. Like, hey, I'm going to take this. Um, did he intend to give it to the Narn to have the Narn flip out and go crazy and beat all the? He must. He must have. Centauri, Otherwise, or why was he use it on the Centauri themselves? Yeah, he I, must I have thought it was a Narn thing because why take it? Otherwise, I guess. I guess. Well, I mean, unless the guy said, "Hey, listen, this acts on on telepathic abilities," and Jakar goes, "Wait." We don't have telepaths, but we have the gene. Maybe it'll do something. And oh boy, did it do something. Sure By the way, the, the the footage on him tripping out 
was kind of cool. Like it was I'm great. Like that. I, that's I, I. I've never. But that's exactly what I imagined it would be. You know, like short. I've, Short story, um, I'll just say that I have probably spent in one sitting at one point mm-hmm. four to six hours staring at my hand. So like that <laughs> that scene when he was like up against the wall and oh, whoa and kind of hearing people's thoughts and then he saw his hand move and he stopped and he looked at it. I'm like, yeah, I know that feeling. I know that feeling pretty all right. And I would have done the exact same thing. <laughs> whoa, look at that. Oh, right. I love that he had, uh, like you knew not only that he was all high and drugged up, but that sure. he was going to be super telepathic and empathic because he had the beta zoid contacts in. Yes, he did. Like I sat there and I went, Oh, his eyes are all black. Oh, that's messed up. What? It, and it wasn't until his eyes went back to normal that I was like, Oh, there's are normally red, you know, I yeah. was like, so his eyes are jacked, man. Like. I kind of hope this unlocks some telepathy in him and we get that more often. Like he looks, right. and whoosh, the eyes go black and you know, it's time. Right. But you know, we've talked quite a bit, especially in the second season when hostilities between the Narns and the Centauri really picked up about how like the Narns just keep getting their butts handed to them. Like these oh. out of shape, fat Centauri are beating up groups of Narns for the first time, like this was the Jakar and the Narn that I thought we were going to see all the way back in the gathering. Just brutal. I'm glad they didn't show any of the beat down, but just the effects of it. Like when he was laying, I mean, the makeup on Londo, he, I mean, three or four hits from permanent brain damage, if not death. Right. Like he, he rocked, rocked him big time. But then he goes into his mind, right? Uh, dude, I mean, he he was one step shy of going, my mind to your mind. He was. <laughs> right? But he jumps in and he catches Londo in probably what has been one of Londo's most embarrassing moments. Which is interesting that that is the embarrassing moment. Think about what we know of Londo. <laughs> we saw Londo flailing on a table, kissing the ass of a golden idol. But this was his most embarrassing moment. Well, it's humiliating right? for him. The emperor wanted him humiliated and saw his worth to the Centauri Republic as a joke. Right. Um, and I think too, to your, so like, you know, he stands there, Jakar sits there laughing at him. Ha ha ha. You're a Joe lot. The great Londo Malari. Right. But you made the point earlier that you think that this is going to be part of the catalyst to Jakar redeeming Londo at some point. Do you think he has some empathy or sympathy even for Londo in this moment? Like, is that Jakar? part of it? Yeah. Does Jakar have sympathy for, for him? Um, maybe, maybe he does. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe until um, he sees, sees the Morden. Cause like, I'll never forget the coming of shadows. Yeah, once, once he sees the Morden stuff, Jakar's like, yeah, you're dead to me. Yeah. Cause that's, it reminded me of the coming of shadows when the emperor was going to apologize, you know, and start making things right. And Jakar was on cloud nine and dancing and bought Londo a drink. And Londo's like, I just sent a superhuman race to kill all of you. Oh my gosh. Right, it's almost right. like this. Like there might've been that moment where like Jakar's like, dude, I'm so sorry. That sucks. And then, oh, 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 this isn't the Centauri that did this. It's you that did right. this. God, Londo is the worst. He's his own worst enemy. Like he keeps, it's he really it's the is. worst. Yeah. Yeah. Londo, uh, just, yeah, he, I mean, <laughs> not, not that he ever expected Jakar to go rooting around in his mind, you know? <laughs> But I mean, so, but did you, did you take note of all the flashes we got? Some of them there during this. Lot. So we saw the hand mm-hmm. reaching out of the thing. We saw the, the shadow ships flying over Centauri. We saw old Londo. We saw what I think we're calling to be emperor Londo. Yeah. That's my, that's what I right? saw. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw a, a bunch of other scenes that I really are just shots from the first couple of seasons, like in real fast order. Right. Um, 
but Jakar understood them all in those moments. Now, obviously, they, for time's sake, they couldn't go through each one of those and and whatever. But we got to talk about the vision, though, Jeff. That vision, which was all important. He looks up and he sees his dad strung up. Now, did we know that Jakar's dad died like that? I feel like we did. We got that in and now for a word when he shared uh, that his dad, he spilled a cup of hot jala on oh. the house mistress that they served and to punish him, they strung him up on a tree for three days and he died there. And his dying wish was that Jakar would stand up and do what his dad did not have the courage to do. Okay. Um, so we saw that. Now, I I was a little confused because I I watch everything with subtitles on. Same. I have I have done this ever since I was a kid. I prefer subtitles. You catch stuff on subtitles that you miss otherwise. But that being said, subtitles aren't always correct. But what the subtitle said was when you had the guy who was up on the tree and then the dude who just appeared like standing right next to him. When that transition happened, the subtitle said that that other guy was Jaquan. Yes. Called him Jaquan. And I went, huh? And then later it was Jalon, which I think is their God. I think I didn't right? ring a bell for me, but the Jaquan fact that is the Jaquan is the, the man like the prophet. Yeah. Right. And he wrote the book and but mm -hmm. he was just a dude back then. Or maybe he was more than that. They said he didn't he come from off Narn somewhere. Or no, I think like that's that. um that's Valen and the Minbari. He yeah, came you're from, right about that. Yeah, yeah. He's the Minbari of not not of Minbar or something like mm -hmm. that. You're right. you're right. But anyway, oh look, no, he was like a farmer or something. Like yeah, just yeah, and it happened to chronicle the shadows down on the yeah. southern continent. So you have Jaquan and and here's Jakar, and he's telling Jakar, he's like, dude, you've got to stop this. Right, like the the hate and the and Jakar's big defense was, well, they started it, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he he tells Jakar basically what I tell my ten year old: it doesn't matter who started it, you can't keep it going. I love <laughs> right? what he said too. It doesn't matter who started it; it only matters who is suffering. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. Like who's getting yeah. hurt by this, and how do we stop that? Who's the bigger person? Yeah, he says when when everyone is dead, no one's gonna care who started it, right? Um, but then he gets into this hole. Uh, he, he says, and and I I would like to quote, um, the the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. He does. I'm not gonna buzz you for that because it's what he says. It's really what he said, right? <laughs> like the some some must be sacrificed to save. The rest and i and i mean i want to make sure that i got it right because i think what i understood him to say was you have to stop this war against the centauri because if you don't it's going to kill all of narn all of narn's going to die because of this and you've got to stop now i'm not really sure exactly what they expect jakar to do about it right he's like but people are suffering and you've you've got to this and is jakar gonna have to sacrifice himself is that what he was trying to tell him I think that's what Jakar thinks like in the very end when he's in that prison cell and just looking full of resolve and religious fervor, I think that's uh -huh. what he believes. But there was a line that Jaquan said just before that, where he said that we have to turn from the cycle of death. Let us turn from that and help the others. And what I think is if I think about Jakar specifically, he's focused on the Centauri. That is, that right. consumes his life right now. Right. Jaquan is telling him, forget that. Forget it. Help the others. This goes back to what we talked about last week with him joining the war council. Jaquan is basically saying, you know more about these shadows than anybody else. You need to help. Yeah. You need to help. But I, what I'm afraid of, my fear in it is that Jakar's takeaway was, I have to sacrifice myself to stop the war with the Centauri. And he's going to head off in that direction. Yeah. Guys, I, that's kind of what I got out of it too, to be honest. But I think you're right. It makes way more sense if we're taking a much bigger look at. Yeah. I think Jaquan wasn't just talking about the Narns. I think he was talking about life. Yeah. The line he said too is we are not alone. We mm -hmm. rise and fall together. 
which to me that's I was the pointed to oh this is this is about more than the Narn or the Narn Centauri war yeah. this is about everything well because then Jaquan who was his dad and then turned into Jaquan and then turned into Jalon which was Kosh totally and we saw Kosh at the at the end and I I I said exactly while they were in the middle of that thing I mean Jeff I, you should have seen it I was <laughs> like I said I said dude this is Kosh who's like come into the room while Jakar is like mind melding with Londo and Kosh was like laid a hand on him or something. And this is Kosh inside Jakar's brain. So all of that was actually said by Kosh, not by Jaquan or correct. Whatever. Like that was Kosh being like, Hey dude, we got to, yeah, gotta I think, this. I think that line was the dad. So Kosh was the dad. He was Jaquan. He mm -hmm. was Jalon. It was literally, Jakar getting in that altered mind state and then this like sequence of, Hey, here's your dad. So kind of relax your defenses a little more and be open. Here's Jaquan who you studied and you have trust, you know, in, in the, so here's the, the, this, and then here's this mythical being of Jalon to just like the exclamation point on it yeah. all. Like it's this real, I think, um, very precise and planned out path that Kosh took him on and it reminds me of when he spoke with uh sheridan in the what was it all alone in the night mm -hmm. when he was on the stribe ship the abduction ship yeah. he had to wait till sheridan was in an altered state of mind and then had to kind of move him through this weird interaction with people that he knew before he got down to the line he said there and the line he said in this one of i have always been here yeah right i've always been here because i've been here since episode one is effectively what he's saying but to and your he point gets to the end. oh yeah go ahead i say to your point though he gets to the end gets in front of the ombuds yeah and i think i think you and i saw the sentencing as different so you said oh he gets 60 days in jail for this he got a minimum sentence of 60 days yeah no less than like right they don't do a maximum sentence on Babylon five. They do a minimum. Maybe so you're going to be there for two months and maybe a whole lot longer, but here's the thing. And I am planting this flag right now. If the next time we see Jakar, he is not in a prison cell. Yeah. I will say some sternly worded things about this series. <laughs> <laughs> like they need to stick to this. He basically needs to be in prison. Uh, what is this season? This is episode six. So two months on this should take us to like, I don't know, episode 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. he should be in there for a while yeah i mean i don't know when they have their season break or whatever but uh yeah yeah he should definitely be it still felt like a very light sentence to me because you you say no less than 60 days but you never gave me the upper limit like maybe they don't have one they don't have a yeah. sentence man what a mandatory sentencing yeah but I thought uh, it was great. Sheridan tried to stand up for him. Dude, he was on drugs. He wasn't this. Yeah. And the ombuds was awesome. Uh, yeah. No, he walked past all kinds of people. He, this was right. premeditated, and he went right for Mr. Yeah. Malari. Which, the other side of that, though, is Londo has some predisposition to hating Malari for everything that they've got going on. This drug heightens all of that and sent him after Malari. Didn't necessarily, like... Like I, I get, I get what the ombuds is saying and I still think Sheridan was right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Maybe that's why he got a minimum of 60 days and not a minimum of 120 60 years. Honestly, <laughs> he didn't kill, like, he didn't kill anybody. He was very, he was very gentle. The listen, end, Jakar, Jakar better be glad that he is in sanctuary and not subject to this because here's the thing. So Lando didn't die. Veer didn't die, but how many Narn are going to die in recompense for this beat down? Because this isn't going unpunished. Well, that's that's what I, I, that's what right. I wonder though. To be honest, because that's what you, that's the initial thought. Absolutely. Oh, well, Narns are going to suffer. They might even die. But the Veer, the Londo that we saw at the end with Veer was a very different Londo than what we've seen in a long time. He was a lot more. Um, he cared about Veer, like his care showed. He desperately didn't want Veer to be seen as a joke by anyone. He was just a softer 
Londo. I wonder, this isn't a turn for him by any means, but I wonder if this is his moment where he's like, all right, Jakar, you, you got me. You got me. Message received. Gonna let that one fly. I am still gonna keep like oppressing your people and looking to exterminate all of them, but I'm not gonna call out that you assaulted me and did all this stuff. I, I could see it being being swept away. Well, Jeff, unless you have anything else, I think we've come down where we've exhausted the majority of the material of this episode. So it is time to boil it all down and see if this show has any of what we call that Star Trekky quality to it. Is it a deep moral message? Does it hold up a mirror to society? Does it give us hope that we're going to be better in the future? I almost feel like I should stop saying that one because I don't think that's going to have anything to do with the rest of Babylon 5. I know. <laughs> but that is a part of the deal. Uh, at, at any rate, um, I'm actually going to rate this one on a scale of zero to five deltas as far as how Star Trek we say this episode is. But Jeff, you're going to get to do Star Furies and talk about how much we enjoyed this episode as far as how Babylon 5 this is. Uh, I'll go first with my deltas. Um, I found a lot of Star Trek messages in this. I don't know how many of them were central to the whole idea of the episode, but there was lots we could pull out. Um, the whole opening scene where freedom of expression is being squished. It was, and, and it all culminates in the one line of there is a big difference between the office of the president and the person who's currently occupying that office. Now I'm looking at 1996 and I'm looking to see who was in office at that particular time, but there's also before, and there's also just kind of knowing this is the way it is always mm -hmm. like that. That phrase will always be true forever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, no matter who is there. Um, but still just the, the whole idea of like, you can't just suppress people's opinions and the right to express themselves. I mean, you can, and you get the disgustingness of what we, what we had. Is that a big Star Trek message? I don't know, but certainly is not something you should do. Um, but it, it gave me this thought speaking out against stuff is not disloyalty and is not sedition, but is actually in fact the exact opposite. It is maximum loyalty and maximum, uh, not sedition, but, uh, patriotism, the, the speaking out because there's what you're doing is you're saying, Hey, uh, I love my country or I love this thing. That's not right. And that shouldn't be allowed to exist to be able to say that. Yeah. It's not, that's not disloyalty. That's, that's, keeping things honest, uh, as a, as a sports podcaster, Jeff, one of the things that I fought in my very early days of sports podcasting was, oh, you're not real media because you know, real media is not a fan of the team. You're clearly a fan. Of, like you say it all the time. You're a fan of the team. Real media is not a fan. You, when you're a fan, you can't give an honest opinion on how things are going. And basically I walked in and I said, BS actually being a fan gives me the most honest assessment of what's happening here because I'm going to call it out for exactly what it is. When my team is sucking, I'm going to tell you that you suck because I want you to be better. I'm going to take you know? it personally. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and here's the, can I go in and be a professional and not act like a fan and not want the autographs and the pictures and, and, and actually, uh, and not just cry with emotion when I'm in there. Yes, I can, because that's called being a professional. But that doesn't mean that I don't have to be a fan. And I, I find that particular line of, of uh, thinking utterly stupid. And to anyone out there who might be listening who is a, a, in sports media, that line is stupid. And you know people in your media room right now who are fans of the team that you cover. You know that they're there, and it's probably you, to be honest with you. Oh, it's not. Yeah, it is. Um, so anyway, uh, speaking out is that, but I mean, how do you not boil this down to the whole thing that Kosh said? I mean, Kosh is God and Kosh is the conscience of the show, right? Like, so you get there, uh, again, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, which is exactly the theme of this whole thing. 
We got to that end. Kosh got hyped up on drugs, mind altered state. And, and basically said, you're going to have to sacrifice yourself or something in order to save everybody else. It does not matter who started it. All that matters is suffering. And Jeff, I think when you come down to those messages right there, but particularly that at the end with Kosh, I don't have to dive too far into that just to go. That's a Star Trek message, man. That's right there. I could see this episode being in Star Trek on um, just about any of the series. Just change a few characters, change a few ships, and boom, it's there. Uh, so I give this a four and a half wow. star, uh, four and a half deltas. That's, I think that's, it's four and a half delta sh show. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm not going to argue. It's a little more than I would give it, but I think it's it's really good. I think the other piece too was a line you mentioned in the recap, and that was when Ivanova was ready to sacrifice her career to blow up Bester, and Sheridan says to her, you have to fight them, but not become, become them. them. Yeah, And that's that Star Trek message of like, you got to, and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's echoed in, in Jaquan's message as well. You got to be the bigger person, right? It's not about who started it or whose fault it is. It's about making it better, uh -huh. you know, and, and, and by, by being true to you for sure. I think for me on the star Fury side, it's hard to take a bester episode and not call it just straight up Babylon five, give it five star Furies, wrap it up and go. <laughs> I think to me, like he represents so much of what represents Babylon five, but yeah. as much as like, this was a great episode. I enjoyed it. It was a thing we didn't talk about. But as important as this was a very well constructed episode, mm. the flow of it, I feel like we thought this was going to start out like at the beginning, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes of this episode, I was like, okay, so we got some drug stuff going on and Bester in here. Okay, cool. This is going right. to be, I think you even said it in your prediction last week. It's not going to be an impactful episode. Like it's going to be mm. kind of a one-off with some stuff that might tie to other things. And I was kind of like, yeah, look, he's right about everything on this one hitting it. But then, but then it just it very slowly morphed and became all about the story, yeah. all about the continuity we've been at and every piece of it, like led to that. It was just beautifully constructed. Mm -hmm. I can't get over though, just the way this show treated Bester. I'm, I'm, I'm standing up for Bester partly just because I know that it'll fire some people up and I enjoyed doing that from time to time, but I also legitimately feel their response to him was way out of line and way turned up and, and, and if nothing else has compromised them more than anything else, but you gave this one four and a half deltas cause it's got a very strong star Trek message messages in it. Totally agree. I also think it delivers those messages in a very Babylon five way in a mm -hmm. really enjoyable episode. I'm going to give this one four star theories. Well, Jeff, uh, I, I don't disagree. I think, I, I, yeah, it's, it's certainly right there. Uh, you know, like last season, though, Jeff, we are creating, we are assembling. I just watched the last Avengers movie again with my son. We are assembling the absolute 100% completely accurate definitive ranking of season three of Babylon 5. Jeff, you get to place this one this week. Where are you going to put dust to dust? Our current ranking, number one is passing through guest enemy. Number two is matters of honor. Number three is voices of authority. Four is day in the strife. And five is convictions. You're going to knock somebody out of the top five today. I imagine you could put it all the way at the bottom. I don't know. Jeff, where are we putting dust to dust? Well, it's not going to number 22. This is not the long dark of the, of the third season. That's uh, that's for sure. But it is tough. And, I, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm questioning a little bit where I want to put it, I'm, I, matters of honor. It just matters of honor was such a great episode, but mm -hmm. there's this part of me that keeps saying in the back of my head, like it was a season opener and it was kind of like the, you know, the next episode is it, was it really that good? And I ultimately think it was. So where I land then is voices of authority, a day in the strife. And I've said it quite a few times on this podcast that I am more into the stuff going on, on down on earth all the stuff there than I am with the shadows stuff or the other mm -hmm. things going on. And so then it's, do I like this or a day in the strife better? And I think that the stuff that really worked in a day in the strife, in the strife was the Londo and Jakar stuff, which this 
took to an entirely new level. So ultimately, I am going to put this one as our new number four, uh, right above A Day in the Strife. All right. I can't argue because I'm not allowed. Well, Brent, that's it for Mm -hmm. Dust to Dust. You said at the beginning of the episode, one of the games that we like to play is guessing what next week is guessing what next week's episode is going to be about based on the title alone. And next week we're watching exogenesis exogenesis and Brent, no, no pressure here, but uh, (sighs) yeah, you, you are, you are nailing it. Now we haven't seen anything about this. Uh No thumbnails, no nothing. Exogenesis is the name Uh of the next episode. Brent, what do you think it will be about? What was the name of that planet that Spock's body in the coffin drifted down to? And got rebirthed. Genesis. Okay, I was thinking Exo something, but it's Genesis. Okay, okay. Yeah, the Genesis planet. Um, yeah. Exo. When you say Exo, that makes me think of Exoskeleton. Exoskeleton has to do with bugs. Genesis is being born. So this is about bugs being born. Oh, this. I got it, Jeff. I know what this is. Okay. This- is the origin story of the shadows Ooh. and their ships and maybe at least their ships, you know, the little like uh spider looking things. This is the origin story of, of uh, the shadows. That's where we're going. All right. Bugs. So exogenesis, exogenesis is a real thing. And it's, oh, is uh, it really? it's like a scientific theory. Okay. That- <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was going to see how far you went with the whole thing. <laughs> But it's a scientific theory that life originated somewhere other than Earth and then over time implanted itself essentially on Earth. So exogenesis, okay. genesis outside of the planet okay. Earth. So I think, I'm not too, I mean, you think it's the history of of the shadows, or at least their ships. And bugs. And yes. bugs, of course, yeah. which maybe are the same. Maybe that's, right? Saying. Maybe all the bugs we see on Earth now are like little seeds of shadows that will grow in the future. I think this is going to be a history of humanity. Specifically, mm-hmm. I think that there's going to be another first one's recruitment mission that they go off on. And on that recruitment mission, they're going to, between the first ones they talk to and the Vorlon, whether that's Kosh or through stories of the Vorlon, they're going to start learning about some of those early interactions with Earth, where they were basically our god heroes or whatever in the early days. We're going to get some color color on that storyline and we're going to find out right here next week what it's actually all about thank you all so much for joining us don't forget to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening to us and if you haven't already please drop by apple podcasts good pods pod chaser audible any of those cool places leave us a rating or review i cannot wait to read it here on the podcast so brent until next time hey jeff Yeah. Clear the deck. Seriously, everybody clear the deck. Get out of the way. (sighs) Activate the forward defense grid. What are you doing? I was just going to say something else. I've been saying for weeks and weeks now that the forward defense grid has been acting up. Jeff, belay that order, please. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know where my head was at. Never mind. Peace. Victory and long life. This is my first time. I was about to just take it from you. I know. And, I was like, and flip it around. I was like, oh, shoot. I'm like, yeah. What? what huh? <laughs> oh, I got lines. <laughs> yeah, that's you, Jeff. <laughs> Your line, not mine. Jeff, have yeah. you ever been in a play? Yes, quite a few. Have you ever completely dropped your line mid performance? I have not. Okay. But I've seen so, it happen to others. Club 65, what's up, y'all? I'm going to tell you a quick story before we get this is this is a Club 65 exclusive story, Jeff. All right. So I was in a play called Was it The Matchmaker? It's it's the original play that the musical Hello Dolly is based on. Okay. If yeah, you've ever the seen Hello Dolly. Mm-hmm. The matchmaker. Um and I'm playing the role, the role of the old man, Horace Vandegelder, right? And this is somewhere in Act Two. 
and the the i'm i'm here talking to like a guy who's like my assistant and then there's like a a, a, a cabbie that i've hired to like do something all right and what was supposed to happen was i was supposed to say something to my assistant say something to the cabbie and then i was supposed to exit and they were supposed to have a conversation about me as they walked off stage okay that's what was supposed to happen well, I've got this cane. I'm this old. I'm in full old guy makeup, right? Um, I think if you remember, Jeff, a bunch of weeks ago, like uh, this might have been like season two. I said, remember when the Wando had the mural of himself on the wall? Yeah. And I said, yeah. I oh, have one of those. This, this is, is the is one the show that the set piece is from. Okay. Awesome. Um, that's what this is from. Anyway, uh, people look at that and would go, Is that your grandfather? Because God, that looks just like you. And I'm like, No, but that's cool. Anyway, um, so that's what was supposed to happen. I'm supposed to say something and say something and I exit. And then they're supposed to have a whole conversation about me. Like, and, and it's, I don't want to say pivotal to the show, but it, like it sets some stuff up. So like it needed to happen. Well, I'm in there and I'm talking, I'm talking and then I say something and I blank on everything I'm supposed to do at this moment. I just could not remember. And I've got my cane and I've, and I, I pick it up and I basically bop the cabbie on the head with it. And I just start berating him. And he's like down on the ground, like cowering, like, ah! and I'm like poking him with my stick. Like, as I'm, <laughs> you know, and, and I just looked at him and I went, well, don't just sit there. Get out of here. And he gets up and he runs off stage. Oh, no. And I'm like, and at, about that moment that he's running off stage, I'm going, Oh, wait, he's supposed to be out here. He has something he's supposed to do. And so I just like, I, I just did this thing where I like, I put my hands on the cane and I just sort of had it in front of me and I just sat there like all superior and I'm going, shoot, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> what am I? And I just, and then I look, I look at the guy, like the assistant guy and I was like, well, don't just sit there, get him back in here. Cause I was like, I got to get him on the stage. somehow. Yeah. like I got to bring him back. So he runs off and I'm just sitting there just staring into the audience. And I start, like, I start breaking the fourth wall. Like I'm making contact with people. And I'm like, you know, what's up. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the time he came back, thankfully I did muscle memory, something, I don't know what it was. I, I was able to get the right line out and then I left and then they were able to consider. And so the 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 way the the stage worked was when you went off stage right basically you hit a wall okay but if you went off stage left like the green rooms back there mm -hmm. and the off stage areas back there but there was a big you just it was wall and curtain and so you had to like walk around behind the curtain to get to, to get. wherever you needed to go right so i go off that way and like i said they're supposed to have a conversation as they walk off stage. So about the time that I get around is about the time that they're off stage. Cause you got to okay. move real slow. So you don't bother the curtain as you move. Right. Mm -hmm. And I get back there and he grabs me, but like, I have like a jacket and he grabs me. It's like, what the hell was that? What were you doing? I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The director who I saw him leave the back of the auditorium, he comes busting in the door. Don't you ever. And I'm like, but it was funny, huh? Right? Like, eh? He doesn't laugh. I, no. I mean, but that's what you're supposed to do. Like, you forget something. Jeff, I, I texted you this a while ago. The show must go on. Exactly. Exactly. You don't just stop and be like, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Like Line. Line. line what am I supposed to say? Yeah. You, you got to pick it up. You just keep going. Like, yeah. Create, create an excuse. Create an off ramp. Do what you got to do and make it happen. Totally. It was one of the things I loved about doing the pro wrestling over the scripted plays was it was bullet point improv. You go out, you fill there in the blanks. Go. And if you screw up, I remember we were doing TV once and screwed up something similar to that. And yeah. everybody backstage has these headsets and we're always talking little walkies yeah. and whatever. And, and it, like for people who don't know, if you ever watch wrestling, the referee has a little thing in his ear. He is being talked to by as many as like six or seven different people. Yeah. And it's just relaying instructions in the ring the whole time. But we've had promos that have gone wrong and the guy's gone to the back early and you just hear over the stuff, get the f back out there. What's wrong with you? Right. <laughs> oh, you got to go back out and come up with a reason why you left. And yeah, it happens. It's part of the yeah. fun. You just gotta, 
do what you got to do. So exactly. Anyway, hey, Club Sixty Five, you guys are awesome. Uh, thank you guys for being here, and um, I guess we're gonna get out of here, Jeff. Yeah, let's go watch some Exogenesis. I like it. I like Just it. sounds hardcore. It does, doesn't it? All right, bye, guys. See ya.